السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم In the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful Alhamdulillah, all praise is indeed due to Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala The nourisher, cherisher, creator, sustainer, provider, protector of one and all وأصلي وأسلم على أفضل الخلق أجمعين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه والتابعين Complete blessings and salutations upon all the messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, those who were sent to remove us from the darkness to the light, to show us the straight path. May blessings and salutations be upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and all his companions, his entire household. And may Allah bless every one of you and your offspring to come up to the end. May Allah bless the ummah at large and humanity. Amin. My brothers and sisters, I was told yesterday that there was going to be a car show, mashallah. I didn't know it was going to be a music show. But at the same time, I was told that it's all about alcohol, it's all about women, it's all about so many other things, and it's about sound. Sound meaning you become deaf, and the guy who wins is he who burst his eardrums. So I just hope that you can hear me. And I think if we were slightly more quiet we probably would be able to hear at the same time it goes to show that as muslimin we are very tolerant and we have to be while we were praying people were doing their thing those who chose to do that it was up to them and those who chose to pray with us alhamdulillah we were not hindered nor were they so this goes to show the, the coexistence it goes to show that we are people who are free to do what we believe is correct on condition that we don't trample on the toes of others. And they are free to do what they feel is correct on condition that they don't trample on our toes. So you might want to ask yourself, hearing everything there that you can hear right now at the back, has it stopped you from coming here and from listening? No, it didn't. So Alhamdulillah, we've been granted a beautiful opportunity in this beautiful stadium here. In fact, I was seated there a few moments ago and I was busy looking, looking at the pitch behind me right now and our children playing. It's amazing. It's such a clean environment, no alcohol, nothing you know, bad, no drugs happening and so on. And it's a clean environment. They're thoroughly enjoying themselves. This should happen more often. And at the same time, you see people seated. I sat for a while after the prayer on the mat, on the pitch. And I felt so good. I didn't even want to get up. It was cool. The weather is absolutely amazing for Trinidad. You know, I don't want to compare it to Zimbabwe because Zimbabwe has some awesome weather. Trust me. And I invite all of you to come there by the will of Allah. Just let me know that you're coming because, you know, if there's about 50 people, I might not be able to put you up. But Alhamdulillah, it's so beautiful. This is the concern for the new generation. This is what they would appreciate. They are playing, they're enjoying themselves. There is a Muslim fair, basically, as you can see, the poster right behind me. There are stalls to my right and to my left. And what are they selling there? They are showcasing whatever they have. They are selling, in fact, so many products that are amazing. And at the same time, the food that is here, oh, mashallah, there is, there is such a big variety that you'd be confused. I, just by having eaten yesterday, I'm feeling bloated, subhanallah. You can imagine all this is done for you. It's done in order to give you an alternative, to give you a time to pass in a beautiful way and to listen to a good word. There are people right now while I'm talking busy playing. I don't mind the fact that they're enjoying themselves. They can always hear a good message later on. But the bulk of you are seated here wanting to listen. And subhanallah, it's such a beautiful environment. Yes. Those who want to pick on it will be able to pick on it. Those who want to say, no, perhaps this is wrong with it and that's wrong with it. You will always find a few things that would happen, perhaps not in the ideal way. But we're not living in an ideal world. Remember that we're trying our best. 
given the circumstances we are in. Remember that. So I started this way because today, if you recall, I promised you yesterday that today we would speak about hope in the mercy of Allah and forgiveness. And the reason why I started the way I did is because that hope and that forgiveness sometimes because of the environment, we feel like we have done so much bad or we are not ideal. So don't let the devil come to you and make you think even for a moment that you don't deserve the forgiveness or mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is why as Muslimin, we are taught to make the most of what you have. The situation you're in won't be ideal when you walk into a mall, when you jump onto an aircraft, when you are in public transport, when you go to work and so on. It won't be an ideal scenario. But whatever is in front of you and whatever situation you're put into, you will bear in mind the values, the morals, the rules and regulations. Do the best you can. You will have to acknowledge people and greet them. As we said yesterday, you will greet people and you will talk to them and you will smile at them and you will give them that feeling of belonging to humanity. Subhanallah. Like I said, if the reward of paradise was given to a man who was compassionate to a dog and a dog, according to some of the narrations, you and I know that a dog is considered dirty to a certain extent. Yet being compassionate to something of that level resulted in a man earning paradise. What about a person who's compassionate to another human being? That's an important question. If Allah gave paradise to someone compassionate to a dog or a cat, as another narration makes mention of, what about a person who is compassionate to other human beings? I'm not talking about Muslims. I'm talking about a human being. So this is why it's important for us to realize we're living in a world. It's not ideal and it will never be ideal. But the test is, have you made the most of your situation? Have you tried your best to be the best person you can? And wherever you have faulted, because obviously, you know, listen to the sound at the back there. It is deafening, which means you can't even tell that it's, it's music. You cannot listen to the particular songs that are being played there. But what you can hear is just a deafening sound and a beat that's shaking a little bit, you know, the ground. And I really would like to even greet the people who are leaving that place at the end and see if they can hear me greet them because they won't be able to hear me. They won't. But at the same time, you can hear what's going on there. Subhanallah. Imagine Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed you to the degree that you have chosen not to go there, but to come here. Wallahi, I won't lie to you. I received a message just now as I was seated here in the midst of the brothers telling me, be careful when you're driving back from the stadium because there will be a lot of drunkards, a lot of drunkards, a lot of drunkards. Yes. Wow. From where? From the car show. Allahu Akbar. I was shocked for a while. I was thinking where they're going to be drinking here. So we have to be careful because it will be a hazard on the road if people were drunk and they were to drive. And I tell you, look at how blessed we are seated here. Absolutely sober. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us. We spoke about issues yesterday and how we get depressed because we've turned away from the rules and regulations set by the Almighty. Islam has a lot of rules, but every rule is there in order to ensure that you're a content person. You're a happy person. You have followed rules and regulations, so now you're happy. The most depressed people on earth are those who just follow their desires. Whatever comes to your mind, you get it done. Whether it is good for you or bad, you're not worried. You're just worried about the fact that I want to do this. So you, a person ends up on drugs, they end up doing things, they end up spending all the money they've earned through the month. At the end of the month, one go at the nightclub or wherever else, the casino and so on. We are taught to be disciplined. Discipline brings about contentment. It brings about a beautiful feeling within you of happiness. It brings about that feeling of goodness. You feel worthy. 
and you feel worth it at the same time. Do you know that, like I said yesterday, for those who may not have heard it, the happiest of people are those who reach out to others, those who have made others happy. If you want to be happy, you must make someone else happy or a group of people happy and make sure that you have not been the reason for others to become sad and upset because that will result in your sadness. You will become upset and you won't know why, but it's because you made someone else upset. Remember, make people happy. Don't make them upset. I would not like to arrive on the day of judgment and I don't think any one of you would like to arrive on the day of judgment and be told or find out that you were the cause of the sadness and the depression and the anger of so many other people. Would you like that to happen? You come on the day of judgment and you're told, you know what? You were the cause of the sadness of so many people. Make life easy for others. Facilitate for them goodness. Don't be a burden. Don't be a hindrance in the path of people where they want to do something good and at the same time even if someone wants to do bad it is your duty to inform them to discuss with them to tell them depending on who you are and at the same time i find the most effective way is to engage them in discussion to engage them in discussion whereby they are convinced that what you're saying is a reality when i was young it was enough for my dad to show me his eye it was enough or just to look at me with a stern face and I would not do what I was about to do. Why? He would just give me a look. And that's enough. That was enough. Today, subhanallah, you need to talk to the children. You need to explain to them. They will tell you, no, dad, you're wrong. And guess what? We are wrong sometimes. I know of people who are wrong as parents and they want to impose those opinions on their children. And guess what? The children write us emails and complain to us. And we have to say, your mom, your dad is wrong. Please show them this email. And you know what? They begin to hate us because they think you're supposed to be on my side as a parent. No, we are on the side of whoever is right. Even if that happens to be a non-Muslim. If they are right, that's whose side we're on. We're on the side of what is correct. It's got nothing to do with who it is. No, some of the parents are racist and they say we're not racist. Racist because they, they believe that whoever is from their background exactly is better than those who come from a different background. That's racism. That's wrong. That's unacceptable. And then when the child wants to marry someone from somewhere else, we say, no way, I'm not going to allow that. But hang on, isn't that racism? No, it's not. So then what is it? Astaghfirullah. What is it? May Allah forgive us. When we deny that we have a sin or we are committing something wrong, then we are losing the forgiveness that we, we would love. We would all love to be forgiven by Allah, but we're not even admitting that we're wrong. And this is why when we want the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we are taught that there are four conditions. Once you meet those four conditions, your sin is wiped out, wiped out. This is directly between you and your maker. There is no third party involved. Nothing in between. Remember that. Nothing in between. <speaking in Hebrew> you alone we worship. You alone we ask for help. Who is that? Allah, your maker. This we repeat so many times every day. You alone we worship. You alone we seek help from. That's Allah. So we worship Allah alone. Seeking forgiveness is an act of worship. Obviously, if you have wronged a human being, you will need to ask them for forgiveness because there is a day of judgment where you wouldn't like to be caught on the wrong side. So the four conditions are to admit your sin. Number one, admit that you are wrong. Without admission, how can you be forgiven? Because you don't even believe you're wrong. I stole something and I, I'm justifying it. I've murdered someone, astaghfirullah, and I'm justifying it. What would happen to such a person? They wouldn't be forgiven because they haven't even admitted. In fact, the example of murder is wrong because it involves another party altogether. But even if you're talking of petty crimes or sins between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and you haven't admitted, 
You know, a person doesn't want to pray and they say, don't worry, I know Allah is forgiving. It's fine. I don't need to pray. <laughs> what are you talking about? You must tell yourself that, look, I'm wrong. Oh Allah, I'm wrong. When you are dressed incorrectly, for example, immodestly, for example, you need to admit to yourself that what I'm doing is wrong. That's the first step to change. If you're not going to admit, you're not going to be able to change. This is not a statement judging you. No, it's just a statement encouraging you to say, just admit. I've done something wrong. I am weak. I am doing something wrong right now. And I'd like to change it. But without admission, you won't even want to change things. Because according to you, there's nothing wrong. I don't have another level I want to get upon because I don't even need to change. This is why number one, admit your error, admit your sin, admit that what you're doing is wrong. Number two, regret it. Without regret, you cannot be forgiven. A person does something wrong. We swore at our own children. A lot of people do this. It's very bad. It's unacceptable. You speak with vulgar language to your spouse or to your child. And you know what happens? We, we never think we're wrong. And even if we end up admitting it, okay, I did. What's the big deal? That's what some people say. If you remind them, hey, please don't swear. Well, I did. What's the big deal? Have you heard that answer? The new generation, mashallah. Sometimes even the oldies do that. May Allah forgive us. Don't ever be arrogant. Forgiveness doesn't come with arrogance. No, you admit it and you regret it. You say, I did and I'm so sorry about it. I really feel bad. That's it. Now you're getting in the right direction. You're heading in the right direction because you admit, look, I was wrong and I feel very bad. Subhanallah. So that, those are the first two conditions. I admitted and I regretted. Number three, be bold enough to say, I seek your forgiveness. That's it. You know, I have seen, this is obviously between us and Allah, where the sin is committed and it does not involve a third party being a human being, then this is between you and Allah. So you tell your creator, oh my maker, I have committed the sin. I'm admitting it. I really regret it. And I'm asking you to forgive me. Three conditions. The fourth condition is, and I promise not to do it again. Wow. I promise not to do it again. Four conditions. The sin is wiped out, completely gone and deleted. If you, if you have a doubt in your heart that this forgiveness, for example, if you are doubting the forgiveness, there is something wrong with your belief in Allah. Never ever did the Almighty say, I will reject the, the repentance of those who turn to me. Not once did he say that. Not at all. You have to be convinced that I'm totally forgiven. It's wiped out. It's gone. I turn a new page and I'm carrying on. Now, there are a few things that come to mind when we say this. Number one, when a person says, I will never do this again. And then later on, they do it again. What happens? That's a very good question. Well, for as long as when you said you would never do it again, you really meant it. And then later on, if the devil came to you or Satan came to you and made you commit that sin again sometime, you need to seek forgiveness exactly the same way you did the previous time. And the two are not connected at all. The Almighty forgave you the first time. If you meet the conditions, He will forgive you a second time. He knows that when you sought forgiveness the first time, you did not plan to commit it again. But because of human weakness or because of some other reason, it was committed again exactly as it was in the past. This does not mean He's going to revisit the forgiveness and undo it because you made a mistake again. He will treat this separately from that and He will forgive you completely. But the problem is, where a person says, Oh Allah, I admit my sin. I regret it. I seek your forgiveness, but I don't promise you that I'm not going to do it again. That's a, or we say, I promise you I'm not going to do it again. But in your heart, you say, mm, I don't know about that. I don't know about that. That's weakness. Don't do that. One of the conditions of repentance is you need to promise Allah. You're not going to do it again. And I know someone might say, well, I'm going to try my best not to do it again. But don't say that. Say, oh Allah, I'm not going to do it again. Be convinced, be strong. Subhanallah. Imagine if there was a, a fire or imagine you were cooking in the kitchen and suddenly you were burnt. What will happen? You're going to say, this is never going to happen again. Right? And after two weeks, you're burnt again. Allahu Akbar. It does mean we're going to try our best. We're going to, you know, cook a little bit in a way that we don't burn ourselves. I know how it happened the first time. I'm not going to let it happen again. So say it's adultery that a person has committed and they say, Oh Allah, forgive me. I regret. 
And as, as much as we may have derived temporary pleasure from that sin of adultery, we need to tell ourselves that, you know what, I'm never going to do this again. And then what happens? You see the person or you see someone that react, the way you behave should be different from the way you behaved previously. It should be different. So you don't allow yourself to get into the same situation that resulted in what happened. This is how you would achieve the forgiveness of Allah. But if for some reason it happened again, I want to tell you don't lose hope in the mercy of Allah. This is why in Surah Zumar, the verse of mercy, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قُلْ يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ لَا تَقْنَطُوا مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَغْفِرُ الذُّنُوبَ جَمِيعًا إِنَّهُ هُوَ الْغَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ O oh Muhammad, peace be upon him. Tell my worshippers who have transgressed against themselves never to lose hope in the mercy of Allah. Never to lose hope in the mercy of Allah. For indeed Allah will forgive all the sins, all of them. He will forgive everything. He will even forgive shirk which is considered the worst sin ever. The meaning of shirk is association of partnership in worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to associate a partner with Allah in worship is the biggest sin ever committed. Allah says, I want to be worshipped alone. And that's the beauty of Islam. What makes a Muslim? A Muslim is he or she who worships his maker alone or her creator alone. No one else and nothing else. That's what makes a Muslim. So when Allah says, the biggest crime you could ever commit is when you change that and when you want to worship people or sticks or stones or graves or trees or animals or any other source of power, any other deities, so to speak, then you've done wrong. You worship your maker alone. That's what makes a Muslim. So Allah says, if you die in the condition where you have not sought repentance, then you are to blame. That's what Allah says. But Allah says, if you are alive and you're breathing and your heart is still pumping, you have hope for as long as that is the situation. You can always turn to Allah. Inna Allah ta'ala yaqbilu tawbat al-abdi ma lam yugharghir. Allah says through the blessed lips of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that Allah will continue to forgive a worshipper for as long as he has not got to the point of gharghara. What is the meaning of gargara? When a person is dying, the soul departs the body. It leaves the body. And as it's leaving, it starts off at the feet. And this is why you notice the feet actually start, the toes start, to, you know, turning in. And then the feet become cold and the soul starts departing. It leaves and it gets to a point where it comes to the throat. When it gets to the throat, the door of forgiveness is now closed because you see the angels of death and you start seeing the world of the unseen and your soul departs. It leaves the, the mouth. It leaves the body. The hadith says, when the ruh comes out, the soul comes out, the, the, the eyes follow that soul gone. And this is why the eyes roll. You notice the eyes rolling when a person passes away. Some of you who may have seen that and the eyes are rolling and then the body, the function of that body is over. It's now gone back to the soil. And as for the soul, it will live on and it will continue. It goes to the prize giving. If you've done well, you get the first prize. If you haven't done well, well, do you know what? It's only you to blame. So Allah says, if a person seeks forgiveness from shirk, from association of partnership with Allah, whilst they're alive, their forgiveness will be accepted. Their repentance will be taken, accepted. But if you die in that condition, you are the only one to blame. This is why my brothers and sisters, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, as perfect as he was, and we all know, we call him Afdalul Khalqi wa Akramul Rusuli, the best of creation, the most noble of all prophets, sinless, spotless. What we do know, he used to say, Oh Allah, forgive me. Oh Allah, forgive me. Oh Allah, forgive me. More than 70 times a day, according to the hadith, the companions say that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to seek forgiveness up to 100 times a day. 
and another narration says more than 70 times the two are the same meaning more than 70 is could be translated as up to 100 that's fine so he was sinless but he used to repeat that so everyone could hear and what about us who commit sin by day and night and we haven't even said oh Allah forgive me I promise you my brothers and sisters if you start your day seeking the forgiveness of Allah one day you will die and on that day the angels would have written that this person started his or her day seeking forgiveness what a blessed death Wow but the problem is when we don't do that the day we die what are the chances of us having sought forgiveness when we haven't even sought forgiveness in a long long time like I said a lot of people say I'd love to die in the condition of prostration where my head is on the ground for my maker and you know the words we say we say subhana rabbi al a'la we are praising and glorifying the one who made us so I'm saying oh you who made me you are all worthy of praise you are the high the highest subhana rabbi al a'la you are the highest who am I praising? Whoever made me, I'm praising him. If you die in that condition, you return to your maker. And what will happen? It's the most blessed death possible because you were just praising your maker and you went back to your maker. So people say, I'd love to die in that condition. But the problem is we don't even prostrate. So what are the chances of us dying in that condition? This is why we say, take your time in prayer. Make sure you fulfill your prayer five times a day. Become strong. Some people are weak. And yes, we do know mankind is generally weak, but certain basic things you must do. I was impressed when I went to Nigeria a few weeks ago and I saw Muslimin who were from a background that was either very wealthy and some who were extremely, for example, poor and so on. But when it came to prayer, they were all together and everyone was there. Even at the early morning prayer, it was packed, packed. And I'm thinking to myself, people from first world countries and people who are really well off, sometimes they don't even know that in the corners of Africa, in the dusty places, for example, or those where people's lives are not up to date, they don't have running water sometimes, they don't have the facilities of electricity and that sometimes. But when it comes to a link with Allah, none of that hindered the link with Allah. They were there and they were there in great numbers and they read the Quran melodiously beautifully I was embarrassed it was motivation for me I was inspired by what I saw people who are serious with their faith and you know what perhaps they have booked their seat in paradise perhaps they have booked their place in paradise and we are busy here thinking I'm a good Muslim but you don't even know your speech is unkind, your attitude is unkind, your character is unacceptable. You don't even live properly with your spouse and your family members, your children and your parents and so on. And you expect to book a place in paradise? Come on! The Prophet, peace be upon him, says one of the characteristics of the people who will have been granted entry into paradise is that their character will be of the highest level. Many people will enter paradise just because their character was exemplary and beautiful. They, they reached out to the rest of humanity. You know, the Prophet ﷺ was asked a question by his companions. The question was as follows. O Messenger ﷺ, what are the characteristics of those who will be granted paradise? Tell us, what are the qualities that will have made them be given entry into paradise? He said, Two things taqwa allahi wa husnul khuluqi consciousness of your of their maker they are conscious of their maker all the time secondly character and conduct now if you pause for a moment and take a look at the two one is your relationship with your maker nice it's solid it's good two the relationship with the rest of the creatures of the same maker everyone else and everything else here is made by whom by allah if you'd like to respect Allah, respect the rest of his creation. Come on. That's the respect of Allah. People today preach the opposite. They say you need to harm these people. You need to attack these people. You need to not talk to these people. You need to. These are all the creatures of the same maker. He made them. What gives you the right and who gave you the right to harm them? True Islam is such that a person's character is felt and it is known automatically even by the enemy like they say in the arabic language al fadlu ma shahidat bihi al a'da'u 
True virtue is that which even your enemy will say, look, I don't like the guy. I don't like this woman. I really detest this and this about this woman. But I need to say that this person really is of good character. Wow. Your enemy is bearing witness. You cannot have better witness than someone who really hates you saying something good about you. Admitting that, look, I need to say this is a reality. Subhanallah. With us, even our friends will confirm that sometimes we need help. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. Even our friends will confirm that our character sometimes is not really good. So these are the characteristics of those who will go into paradise. Come on. You will enter paradise through taqwa Allahi. You will enter paradise through husnul khuluqi, which means your character. One connected to your maker, the other connected to your relationship with the rest of the creatures of the same maker. One is called huququllahi, the rights of Allah. The other is huququl ibad, the rights of the worshippers of Allah, the rest of the creatures of Allah. And this is why the story of the dog and the cat came into play. We ask Allah to grant us Jannah. Ask yourself, how am I going to enter paradise? Is it through this one or through that one or a combination of both? Please try and fit in somewhere. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us paradise. Like we always say, Allah looks for any excuse to forgive you and to grant you paradise. Any excuse, but give him that excuse. Give him something. There must be a deed. You know, when we sin, we commit sin privately, right? We don't want people to see. We're embarrassed. I committed a sin, for example. I don't want people to know. It's quiet. It's between me and Allah. It's between me and my maker. We are the first to say, please don't judge me and so on. Why is it that we don't have good deeds that are also a secret between us and our maker? You know, and Allah knows. Have a few good deeds that no one knows besides Allah. You know, and Allah knows. So on the day of judgment, you see your sins and they're between you and Allah. And then there are good deeds and they're between you and Allah. I'm sure you will have reason to smile. Let me complete the hadith for, for benefit for all of us. The Prophet was asked, what are the characteristics of those who will enter hellfire? May Allah protect us all from that. He says two things, two main things, al-famu wal-farju. People will enter hellfire because of the tongue and because of the private parts. Wow. Astaghfirullah. May Allah forgive us and strengthen us because of the abuse of the tongue and the abuse of the private parts. And this is where we're taught morality and character conduct how do you speak to people what do you say with your tongue how do you use the tongue of yours you abuse it the prophet says well one of the characteristics of those who will be entering hellfire is that they were not even bothered what their tongue was used for not at all and subhanallah there is another powerful narration where the prophet says Whoever can guarantee me the correct use of two things, I guarantee him or her a place in paradise. Did you hear that? Whoever guarantees me the correct use of two things, I guarantee him or her a place in paradise. What are the two things? He says, whoever guarantees me the, the correct usage of that which is between the cheeks and that which is between the thighs, I guarantee him or her a place in Jannah, in paradise. Wow. It seems very simple, doesn't it? But that's your entire life. Watch your tongue. Watch how you treat people. Take a look at others, those whom you don't like, and ask yourself, how do I speak to them? It's not a question of who you love. When you love someone, you might even lie to them. You know, sometimes when people say, I love you, it's become so cheap that you doubt, start doubting whether they actually do. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. May He make us genuine people. So my brothers and sisters, don't lose hope in the mercy of Allah. But we need to be people who do something about it. I cannot not change at all. I cannot be a person who doesn't want to admit my faults. I cannot be a person who continues in my bad ways. I cannot be a person who continues committing acts that are unacceptable. And then I say, don't worry. We were told never to lose hope in the mercy of Allah. And we were told we will be forgiven. You're not just forgiven like that without seeking it. Ask for it. And when you ask for it, be genuine, be sincere. MashaAllah, tabarakallah. So my brothers and sisters, look at Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He walked with his companions one day and they passed a lady who was breastfeeding a child. And he asked a question to his companions. Very important question as they passed the lady. 
He says, do you ever, can you imagine this woman throwing this baby into the fire? Can you imagine this woman throwing this baby into the fire? And they said, no, never. I mean, the child is suckling so close. You know, the relationship between mother and child, and that's just a newborn. Subhanallah. Can you imagine this woman throwing the child into the fire? They said, no way, never. Then he says, well, I want you to know that Allah is more merciful upon you than this woman can ever be upon this child. Wow. Wow. Subhanallah. Doesn't that bring a smile to the face, a little bit of hope where we feel that, okay, yes, yes, there's a bit of hope for me, no matter how bad I am. You know, you have children, Alhamdulillah. May Allah bestow those who don't have children with children. I mean, May Allah bestow those who don't have children with children. May He give you the gift of children. But for those who do have children, you know your child can break a glass. Your child can do something really badly wrong. At the end of the day, that's your child. I love my child. Don't we say that? That's my baby. That's my child. Oh, please don't do that again. We will cry and we will pray because the child went into bad company. But we won't ever say, you know what? That's not my child. There is a spot in the heart of a mother. And this is why this incident was made mention of where there was a mother and a child, not a father and a child. I'm not saying fathers are distant, but the heart of a mother, because the mother bore the child, the mother held the child for nine months, the gestation period, and bore, bore the child as in given birth to the child. So the mother's heart is somehow attached no matter how criminal the child becomes there is a spot in the heart of the mother that always has some hope it always has some form of goodness in it that's my son inshallah he will come back the mother will go to the prayer mat and cry to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying oh allah take my child out of the nightclubs oh allah take my child out of this habit and keep on crying and never losing hope and hoping that one day the child will come and just hug the mom and say mom I've quit all my bad ways. Wow. I'm sure all the mothers know what I'm talking about. You could relate to what I'm saying. Well, I want to tell you Allah has much more mercy upon you than any mother can ever have upon any child. You need to know this. So when you've done wrong, come back and embrace the goodness. This is what we're saying. Just like you want your child to embrace you and say, I've quit all the bad. We need to go and embrace what is right and say, I've quit all the bad. Oh Allah, forgive me. That's when you achieve the forgiveness. That's when you make Allah happy. My brothers and sisters, we have had messages from so many people. We have heard good from a lot of people, but it's not enough just to listen to the good. Act upon it, spread it to others, speak about it, message it to people, tell people something, tell them something good, explain to them. This is what it's all about. This is what life is all about because when you spread good, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves you more because he knows you've become a person who is now beaming that goodness to others. I give you an example of a business. You know, there are products on sale. Say, for example, here at the Muslim fair, products on sale. If you were to meet one of the brothers or sisters here and say, I like this product, can I become an agent? And they say, yes, okay, you can become an agent. And you become an agent where you are spreading the product and making it well known and selling it, mashallah, like hot cakes. I should have said hot doubles, but anyway, it's okay. Like hot cakes, subhanallah. We're selling it. What will happen? You become the main agent. Oh, they love you. They might even give you shares. They might give you something. They will give you something good. Wow, that one day they will acknowledge you at the end of the year when they have their party, they will invite you and you are one of the main people because you, you're making more business, subhanallah, than anyone else. You're beaming, you, you're actually spreading the product. The same applies to goodness. It's a different example, but it's just to understand. Bring it closer to the mind. You have become a person who works for Allah. You do good and you call others towards goodness. So Allah says in the Quran, وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَوْلًا مِّمَّنْ دَعَا إِلَى اللَّهِ وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا وَقَالَ إِنَّنِي مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ Who can there be better in speech than the one 
who calls towards goodness, who calls towards Allah and does good deeds himself or herself and says, I am from among those who have surrendered. You surrender, you call others towards surrendering. And here when we say surrendering, we are not speaking of something barbaric. We are speaking of the goodness and the kindness and the, the peace and serenity that is taught by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like I said, in order to achieve happiness, you make others happy. And you don't make them happy when they want to transgress, but you make them happy with that which is within the pleasure of Allah. You know, you don't go back home and say, okay, we were told to make our children happy. So here's a cigarette and here's the drugs and here's the money to go and gamble. And so, no way. They'll be excited. They'll be happy. That's not what we're talking about. You know what I mean. So Allah says, there can be no one better in speech than the one who calls towards goodness. He calls towards the path of his maker. And at the same time, he does good. Which means, don't be a hypocrite. Don't call people towards goodness and you forget yourself. And you know what? Wherever you have faltered, go back to Allah. My brothers and sisters, we are affected and influenced by our environment. And you and I know that in the environments we live in, there is good and there is bad. If you're in good company, it will be easier for you to do good. If you're in bad company, it will be easier for you to do bad. However, as soon as you remember, when you have a reminder of the nature of this one this evening, turn to Allah. Don't wait for, okay, tomorrow morning I'm going to change. No, right now in your heart, say, oh Allah, forgive me. Oh Allah, I repent. Oh Allah, I'm going to be a better person. Oh Allah, the way I've been speaking to people, I'm going to improve. Oh Allah, those who work with me or for me or those whom I work for, I'm going to treat them in a better way. I'm going to speak to them properly. Do you know that your tongue and just the way you speak can make the day of so many people and not only the day, they would just love you. They would love to be in your company. Why? You use your tongue wisely. You say good words. You choose your words before you speak. You choose your words before you speak. This is what is supposed to be. Every one of us. Imagine we all have a tongue. We all have a brain. A winner is the one who can join the two. You think before you utter. We can all say things. Even the children can say things. You know, when you're hurt, what do you say? A lot of people just swear. Do you know that? When they see a nice thing nowadays, they swear. You see something awesome. Instead of saying, mashallah, do you know what they say? I don't even want to say it here because it's an embarrassment. But they swear. A big swear word. It's become a way of saying, wow, that's so good. But it's a swear word. When something bad happens, we swear. Something good happens, we swear. Don't do that. You're a believer. Utter good words. Say, Alhamdulillah, all praise is due to Allah. Say some nice words. MashaAllah. Tabarakallah. Become happy at the happiness of others. And feel it when others are enduring, going through hardship. This is why the hadith speaks about reaching out to people with your charities. Reaching out to people with your charities. A lot of us would think that that only means to take out the dollar and to give it. You know, I've got $200, $500, so I will give $5 or $10. And I give it, that's my charity. Do you know that something more important than that is your character, your conduct? And I will give you two examples. The hadith says to smile is a charity. Do you know that? It's called a sadaqah. Sadaqah, you and I know it means a charity. It actually means a monetary charity. The term sadaqah usually refers to something monetary. Usually it would refer to something monetary. If you say I gave out a sadaqah, a lot of you would know that it means a few dollars I must have given to someone or I gave something material to someone. But Muhammad says no, it's not only material. It includes a smile. It includes a good word. Amazing. So that goes to show that you've got to be charitable. The second example is that of the Quran. Allah says, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu la tubtilu sadaqatikum bil manni wal adha. O you who believe, do not destroy the rewards of your monetary charities by bragging about it and harming people with your character or in any other way. 
which means I gave ten thousand dollars. And then I started saying, I am the one who gave ten thousand dollars. Ah, you just nullified your reward. Why did you have to brag about it? If you are saying it in order to encourage others, you're a group of businessmen or businesswomen, or you're a group of people and you say, look, I gave a hundred, please give a bit more than a hundred. Or you know what, if I gave a hundred, I'm sure you can give more. With the idea of encouraging each other, there's nothing wrong. But bragging, everything is wrong. You don't brag. For example, you gave a charity, you helped someone with a bit of money and 20 years down the line, you say, you know what, if it wasn't for me, you wouldn't even have been here. Don't ever say that. Don't ever go back to let people hear what you did. I know of a case where someone gave someone else something and they happened to start doing business with it. And later on, a few years later, this business grew and this first person kept on reminding the second person to say, you know what? I gave you. If it wasn't for me, nothing would have happened. I gave you. If it wasn't for me, nothing would have happened. This guy took the amount, multiplied it by 10 and went back to give it to him to say, here, put it into your mouth. I don't want to see it again. I don't want to ever hear you again. He was like, but why? Because you every time you want my ears to hear that you are the guy, you are not the guy. I appreciate the fact that you did help me. Yes, but you don't have to keep on coming to harp and keep on reminding me. It's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who allowed this wealth to grow. If you helped me and I suffered a loss, what would have happened? Would you have come to me and say, I gave you money and you lost it? Perhaps that's what would have happened. But it's Allah who gives increase, doesn't he? Not you. So we irritate people sometimes by reminding them we did good to you. If it wasn't for me, you wouldn't have been here. Keep quiet. That should have been for the sake of Allah. And Ada. Ada means one is bragging and one is harming. You are a very charitable person, but your character stinks. Astaghfirullah. You give out charities, but you are bad to your workers, those who work for you or those whom you work with or for. Bad to them. You're evil. Your heart is dirty. What's the point of your charities? Clean your heart. Then you will see the bright effect and the positive effect of your charity. But without cleaning your heart, what do you expect? At home, we're a mess. Everywhere else, we're a mess. And we claim, oh, we're charitable people. Allah says, you know what? That charity of yours, we don't need it. To improve your character is a better charity than to just give a monetary amount that is spoilt by your evil ways and habits. I'd rather not receive anything from a person and enjoy their good company than to get things from them and have to endure the evil that comes from them. Many of us would agree. I know of cases where, you know, in a lot of the cultures that we have, and I'm sure it's in Trinidad as well, to a certain extent. You get married and where do you live? You live with your folks, okay, for a while. So your in-laws are right there and they're in your face every day. Okay, sometimes it's an honor, it's a pleasure because they're lovely people. Nobody minds living together with an extended family if they're all understanding and beautiful. You live and let live. But sometimes what happens is we live and the conditions are so tough. You know what? Some of the wives will say, I don't mind living in a hut, but I don't want to endure this type of behavior. That's what some of the women will say. I don't mind living where? In a hut, but I don't want this type of behavior from your mother or from your father or from anyone else. This goes to show that people prefer character, good character, than one who has a lot of wealth sometimes. Even those from amongst us who want to get married, whether it's the spouse, the, the wife or the husband. And they have a lot of wealth, but they are really evil in their ways and habits. Even if you married for the money, you would be depressed within a week, two weeks, three weeks. Everything is over. That's it. That's why in Islam, Allah says you marry for character, conduct and deen. Look at the person you want to marry. They need to have two types of relationships. Their link with their maker must be good and their link with the rest of the creation must be good. The Prophet Muhammad says when someone proposes to you and two things happen to be in order with them, then let them get married. Someone has come and they want your daughter's hand in marriage and she is interested in that as well. You know, in Islam, you're not allowed to force the women at all. Never. Some people, 
because of the culture that they may have been living in, tend to force their women to marry whom they want. It's happening to this day. But that is un-Islamic. It's unacceptable. It's a major sin. It may block your place in paradise. It may book or reserve a place for you in hellfire. You're not allowed to do that. The hadith says, when someone comes asking for the hand of your daughter, you look at their, their connection with their maker and the connection with the rest of the creatures of the same maker. One is known as deen, which means the religion. And two is known as akhlaq. Akhlaq means their character and conduct. One is huququllahi, the other one is huququl ibad, which means one is the rights of Allah being fulfilled and two is the rights of the rest of the creatures being fulfilled. When the person is responsible enough to fulfill their duties unto Allah and to fulfill their duties unto the rest of the creatures of Allah, then allow that marriage to happen if your daughter is interested. If she's not interested, no matter how good the guy is, it will not happen. She has the right to say, no, not at all. I don't want. You cannot force. Not in Islam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala strengthen us. So this goes to show that in Islam, what is happening today to us is not the way it's supposed to be. What's happening? The first thing that happens, someone wants your daughter's hand in marriage. We say, what do you work as? How much money do you have? Money? You don't know when they're going to die. Money? If they're responsible, they will look after your daughter the same way they look after themselves. But if they're irresponsible, no matter how much money they have, your daughter's not going to benefit at all. She's going to be depressed in the home. Why? It's an irresponsible person. So it's got nothing to do with money. It's got to do with character, conduct, and the relationship with Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. As simple as that. This is why we say rules and regulations. Sometimes we don't want to understand, we don't want to hear, we don't want to be told. But here I've said as much as I could this evening. And I hope and I pray that we are motivated to do good. I hope we have more hope in the mercy of Allah. And I hope we are motivated to seek forgiveness of Allah, to change our ways and habits. Like I said, the environment is not ideal. We will falter now and again. We, we will drop. We will fall. A winner is he or she who gets up from the fall and continues walking on the path. Not the one who falls, so now they dig a hole and they become comfortable in that particular hole. No. You're doing something wrong, start telling yourself, it's about time I came out of this. And I have no guarantee when I'm going to breathe my last, so let me come out now. Subhanallah. My brothers and sisters, it's been an honor speaking to you. I really pray that Almighty grants me the guidance and change it, makes me change my bad ways and habits firstly, and then every one of you. May Allah guide you and may Allah bless you in every way. I'm deeply touched by your concentration and the fact that you've sat for a long, long time, subhanallah. And at the same time, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless every one of us and to grant us a beginning. When you're driving home this evening, please take care. I give you the advice I was given moments ago. Please be careful of drunk drivers and be careful of people who may not know if you were to horn, they perhaps won't be able to hear you because you know what happened. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us and grant us goodness. Wa sallallahu wa sallama wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad. Wa sallamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allahu, Allahu, Allahu.